A Musical Life with Crystal Mangano, composer for the new documentary Asperger's Are Us. Crystal Mangano is the composer for Asperger's Are Us, a new documentary that follows the story of the first comedy troupe made up of people with Asperger's syndrome. What makes Crystal's education unique is the fact that she actually double majored in both film and composition, giving her a deep perspective when it comes to providing music to film and television projects. This episode of A Musical Life is brought to you by the Online Piano School at ArtistWorks, where I teach people all over the world how to play the songs they love. Right now, ArtistWorks is running a special contest where you could win the chance to get a free year of piano lessons. For more information, visit amusicallife.com forward slash piano school sale. Once again, that link is a musicallife.com forward slash piano school sale and piano school sale is all one word, no spaces. Welcome to A Musical Life. I'm Hugh Sung. With the 2016 South by Southwest Festival behind us, we're wrapping up our look at some wonderful composers who contributed to some amazing films that premiered there. As I mentioned in the opening, Crystal was a double major in film and composition at Montana State University. She currently resides in Los Angeles and works as a music editor for several films and television shows. What does a music editor do? Well, you're about to find out. Let's start by listening to one of her tracks from Asperger's Are Us called New Material. Crystal, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you, Hugh, for having me. Absolutely. And congratulations on scoring the music for the documentary Asperger's Are Us, which just premiered at the South by Southwest Festival this past March 12th. Uh, I understand that Netflix just picked it up for distribution. That's fantastic. They did. We were all very, very excited about it. It was a great experience at the festival. And then to be able to walk away knowing it, that people are going to be able to see it on Netflix is just so exciting. Oh, wonderful. Can you share with us the premise of this film, which was directed by Alex Lehman? Yeah. So it's a, it's this documentary that follows a group of four guys based out of Boston that have a comedy troupe. And they met when they were all little kids at camp. And they all have Asperger's. <laughs> Interesting. So, they they bonded at camp when they were young over their love of humor and really just kind of found found a lot of friendship through that with each other and so they they created this comedy troupe called Asperger's RS and so the documentary follows what they think might be their last show before they kind of go separate ways you know go off to college um, they're starting to you know be more involved with their jobs and careers and. You know, the, just not knowing what the future of their comedy troupe is. So the documentary follows, follows them preparing for that. 
Interesting. Well, I think with the release of this documentary, they might suddenly find themselves back in demand as a comedy troupe, right? <laughs> they they might be. I know they uh, they came to the film festival and they were very well received. People loved them, and I I'm sure that that only sparked their interest in continuing. So, and did you get a chance to meet them, the the people that were featured in the documentary? I did. I did, and it's funny because you know you work with them in the, I I didn't meet them until the festival, but of course, having worked on the film for so long, I felt like I knew them. So it was kind of an odd experience, you know, feeling like I know so much about these people who have no idea who I am. It's like you're stalking them. Exactly. It felt a little weird, but, uh, but it was so great to meet them in person and just, just get to experience them in real life. So, you know, for those folks who are not familiar with Asperger's or who have never met anybody with Asperger's, what were some of your observations on meeting them? I know it's it's interesting that it's great that they can create comedy out of their con- their situation, and yet there may be some social stigmas too as well. I'm wondering if you could share some honest thoughts about your meeting with them. Sure. Uh, you know, it was it was interesting because in the documentary you see so much of their interaction with each other. And you really kind of get to see this side of them that when you meet them in person, you realize takes a long time to get to. And it's, they're very, um, you know, they're the, a couple of them were just only joked with me in person, just, uh, (laughs) continued on the comedy, comedy routine. Whenever we would chat, there were, uh, one of them in particular was extremely shy. Um, and so it was interesting, you know, you for. I forget that having watched them in the documentary with each other, that they are very shy. And so it, it takes a while to really kind of gain their trust and, and to be, to be yourself around them. It's incredible. Did they come up with their own comedy on their own or did they have somebody write it for them? No, they, they write it all. And, uh, it's a very specific type of comedy and it's, I think it's very funny. It's, it's the kind of comedy that it takes a little while to get to the punchline, but once you get there, it was worth it. <laughs> and it's just very, very observational, very, uh, lots of puns. They, they see in their comedy, they, they utilize a lot of puns. Um, but they, they actually, they do most of the comedy that they do as a troupe is pre-written rehearsed sketches. And at the festival, we got to see them do some improv, which was fantastic. They were amazing at that, which just surprised us all. They were just so good at improv. Wow. Wow. Oh, I'm so excited that everybody's going to have a chance to not only see this wonderful documentary, but also to hear your music. So I'd like to spend some time now focusing on you. I'd like to talk about three tracks from your score for Asperger's Are Us. Now, we just, okay. we just heard a track called New Material. Now, even though I haven't seen the documentary yet, I feel like I've, I've I got the gist of it thanks to your wonderful <laughs> description. Now, it's interesting. In this particular track, you seem to capture uh, a sense of childlike wonder, but it's mixed with a kind of muffled texture with the use of these electronic layers. Now, the, the words mm-hmm. that come to my mind are joy, intimacy, I, I almost want to say claustrophobia, something that feels closed and detached from the world. It's not the right word, but it's not in the bad sense. Oh. And it's interesting because a lot of so, you know musical sounds, we add echo and reverb to give a sense of space, right? But you mm-hmm. actually, it sounds like you purposely t- turned the reverb off to make it sound much more intimate. There's no sense of space around the music. Can you describe what emotions you were trying to evoke with that track and with your use of the quality of the sound in particular. Sure, yeah, and 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 thank you for your response to the music because that is exactly what I was going for. So Yay. that makes me extremely <laughs> happy that, that that came through. Wow. Um, yeah, especially the, so for the track New Material, the, the child, it, it's a, a piece of music that a version of it plays early on in the film where you see them meeting when they're younger and you see them as children um, interacting with each other and then it, comes back at the end to come full circle as they are writing new material at the end of the show. Mm. And it really, you know, it was just, there's such a, a sweetness, um, for lack of a better word, but, uh, about these guys and just such a, they're the relationships that they formed with each other is very, very tight. It's very, you know, it's, 
it's the the kind of relationship that I think is only understood between between the people involved. And it just they they formed this bond that enabled them to really grow uh, within within their group. But also, you know, one of them talks about how by the end of high school he was voted most outgoing, which he <laughs> said, you know, was just crazy because yeah. that's just so not expected. Interesting. And the what they were able to do with each other through their experiences growing up um, just really tied them all together very closely. But it's really fascinating that I don't know, was that intentional that you use the element of reverb in a sense to take away the sense of space, you know, and, and space for Asperger's is a critical component of their interaction with the wider world. In other words, they sometimes a person with Asperger's may get too close. They don't understand the concept of personal space sometimes. Right. And, and it seems that your music reflects that so brilliantly in the choice of sound effects. I had what I was what I was hoping to accomplish was, you know, a lot of times, you know, music for a film is you're trying to have the audience experience something in reaction to what's going on screen. And for this, I wanted people to be experiencing what they would they are feeling and not necessarily what the audience should be feeling watching them, but to really be in that in that circle. And so that was that that you know that lack of sense of space I guess was part of it is that it's just this very it's just they have very it's very direct experiences with the world and a lot in a lot of ways things are very black and white there you know there isn't a lot of gray area. Yeah. But I I again I just want to say how brilliant I think your choice and your composition was to depict without being overly uh, without being overly sentimental, but it's just right. just just the right amount of music and texture. It's a brilliant job. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's it's uh, it's tricky a lot of times to get the right the right amount of emotion. Mm. And so what I find I tend to do a lot is I'll go overboard, you know, <laughs> and I'll go I'll just I'll just you know let kind of you know break down the the you know the fence there and just let myself be incredibly emotional and then pull it back you know <laughs> interesting because, yeah it's just because i feel like i you know you want to go there you just want to be you know as emotional as you can in some places and then you know a lot of times it comes back and what you'll end up with it was just the very kernel of the idea that you started with and it's and try i i like to try and do as much as possible with as little as possible is one of my goals now, I love this track called Aliens at the Show. Thank you. I, this is one of my favorite pieces from the score. I really loved how this one turned out. <laughs> you know, I love this cool opening that you create and then the funky reggae rhythm that introduces this delightfully quirky melody that sounds like something. Now, here you put the cheese on. It sounds like something out of a cheesy 1950s sci-fi movie. Can, right. you, can you describe the scene that you were scoring this for? I love this. I would love to. Yeah, This. so this scene is you're with... One of the uh, guys in the troupe, Noah, and he is talking about preparing for the show and how ideally he would, they, you know, they, they, he talks about his, his comedy, but at the show, he would just love for it to be so, so popular that 
aliens would come to Earth to try and go to the show and would be turned away because it's just too pop. You know, it's there's no room. And then and then he goes on to say, you know, but he's realistic. And so if the aliens get into that's OK. <laughs> so and I think it just really shows that whole scene just shows his, you know, his approach to the comedy, his approach to life, his he's just the whole comedy troupe has such a sense of fun mm. about them that they're just doing this because they enjoy it and they love it. That's so cool. And I and that scene in particular really showed Noah in a fantastic way. Now, this track, First Rehearsal, has a kind of hoedown feel to it. Now, what scene was this for? And did you use only electronic instruments or were there any other acoustic ones in there as well? So this uh, this first rehearsal track is for the very the first time that you see them rehearsing for their show. And they set out they don't have a rehearsal space. (laughs) So (laughs) they start they're just basically going all around town trying to find a place to rehearse and spend most of their time just attempting to rehearse. (laughs) And so they, you know, they start off in a mall and then they get kicked out of the mall (laughs) and then they're on the street, but then they get kicked off of that particular block and then, you know, they just keep going. And it's the, there's kind of a, a circus feel to me about Mm. it and just kind of a, it's, it's just kind of absurd. <laughs> and, and that's where the hoedown musical element comes in, eh? <laughs> exactly. That's where that came in. And so I just, I I wanted it to be a little wacky and just a little out there because these guys are a little wacky and a little out there. <laughs> and so I, this, this then became kind of thematic throughout the rest of the film for when they were rehearsing. And for this, there were a lot of... Um, a lot of electronic elements. I did have a good friend of mine, Ray Brinker, is a fantastic drummer and percussionist. And so he came in and we recorded a lot of live percussion with him. And he really just elevated the track immensely. Mm-hmm. Um, he and like I was saying before about, you know, I, the, the, but the, well, there was no budget. <laughs> this this. So, Again, trying to find ways to do as much with as little as possible. So I knew that for this score, percussion and drums really were vital. And so I wanted to bring him in and record that live. Absolutely. So, And we did notice, uh, I was speaking with Alex, the director, about this afterwards. And, you know, he was saying... When I said I, I wanted to bring in this drummer, he was going, "Okay, you know, I'm I trust you, whatever, whatever you need to do, and and just how much life it brings mm. to the track to mm. have though to have that live percussion and drums as opposed it, to a drum track, absolutely, exactly. It just, I mean, it just you know became something that felt alive mm. instead of just kind of in the background. So I wanted to ask you, how did you get involved with this project? And and you just kind of alluded to your interaction with Alex. Did he have a lot of input into the sound he was looking for? Or did he just completely trust you and let you do whatever you wanted? You know, it was was a lot of, um, a little bit of both, actually. So I was introduced to this project through my friend Sean Bradley, who is one of the producers on the film. And he had come to me, they were... I actually didn't know that they were working on this project. He had kind of been keeping it in the background. So he brought it up to me and I started out by just writing a piece that we thought could be kind of thematic and maybe used throughout various places of the film. And 
I started working on it and I just realized that I couldn't just write one piece for mm. this movie. I mm. needed, I, I had to keep going mm -hmm. and I just couldn't stop myself. Actually. <laughs> so the first, Despite the fact there's no budget, right? <laughs> right? Despite the fact that there's no budget. I just, I, I loved the film. I loved these guys that are in it. I, you know, I just, I was so excited about this project. So instead of sending him, instead of sending Alex the, you know, that one piece, I sent him the first 10 minutes of the film. Oh, wow. And they, um, they, he and the other producers just loved it actually, which mm. was fantastic because that was a little risky on my part <laughs> to just jump right in without, without a lot of direction. Interesting. And they really liked it. And so I just, I kept going and for the most part, um, I think Alex and I just really kind of saw the film in very similar ways mm. and that helped. I, th I think we both understood what, or at least I understood what Alex was, what his intentions were for the film and why he was doing this and why he loved the project and to find ways to kind of bring that out in the music as well. How long did he give you to put the music together? This, it happened very quickly. I think <laughs> it probably happened over the course of a month. Oh my goodness. That's incredible. How much music did you have to write for the whole project? I think there are about 34 pieces oh my goodness. in the film. So probably, you know, probably an hour's worth of music or so. Um, so it, it. It happened very quickly. <laughs> I'm gonna play. I'm gonna play this interview for a lot of my composition students and friends, and say, "Hey, come on, that 10 minute piece. <laughs> stop, <laughs> stop dawdling after six months. I need it now." <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the that's the danger of having the quick turnaround. Is then people go, "Oh, well, you did you did this." There one you go. Month. <laughs> you know, you should be able to do this overnight, right? <laughs> right, exactly. It's dangerous to do that. But then it was. We did have uh, some back and forth. Um, there were some changes that we made just a little bit before the festival. We put in a new opening and oh my goodness. <laughs> some, some other things. And so they, that the very open was probably the, the place where Alex and I had the most back and forth. Mm. And we, it was very funny because we realized at, um, at at the festival, I fi we finally realized what each other was talking about. Oh no! It was really at the festival that you were rewriting this beginning. Well, no, so I wasn't rewriting it before. Then we had finally arrived at it, but it had just it had taken us much longer to arrive at that particular piece than everything else in the score. Huh. Everything else seemed to be, you know, maybe a couple changes, and that was it. And this one, we just couldn't get it, and and you know, it was. Alex was saying, he's like, no, it's, you know, he's like, it's okay if we don't get it. And I'm saying, no, it's not okay. It's the Aww. open. It has to be right. You know, Aww. we have to get this. And so you were we, directing him. <laughs> we, finally, we, we finally got it. And it, but it was funny because, you know, you just realize how interesting communication can be and how, you know, when one person says one thing, they, you know, the other person interprets it a different way. And so we were, the, what in particular he had said he was asking for what he was calling the spaceship sound. Hmm. And I just had no idea what he was <laughs> talking about. I go, I don't, I don't know. And so I would try, I'd go, okay, I think I know what he's talking about. And I would hmm. do something that to me sounded kind of like a spaceship that I had used somewhere. And I was like, nope, that wasn't it. You know, we go back and forth. And we finally at the festival, that's what we were laughing at, because I did finally realize he meant the um, there's kind of that train whistle that comes in yeah. and, and we were laughing because what I realized, I said, Oh, because of, as we listened to earlier, that aliens at the show, uh -huh. that whistle is very prominent in there and uh -huh. has that kind of space element. And so that's <laughs> where he got the spaceship sound. And so I just, it was just one of those things where I was like, Oh my gosh, I finally get it. You know, mm. I, so anyway, it it can be it can be challenging sometimes to figure out what each other means, but you get there eventually. That's, so that's so cool. Okay, we've had a taste of your music, but only from one film. I'm wondering if you could share a few other tracks from some of the other film and TV projects that you've collaborated on to help our listeners understand your sound world better. And I, I, you also use a lot of electronic sounds and textures that I've noticed when I was listening to some of the other things that you've scored. I do. I I use a lot of um I like I like to 
keep a varied instrumentation. And so I like to just try things that maybe wouldn't typically go together or use things in a way that is a little unconventional just to so that it sounds fresh to me. So this piece, Shame, is one that I just wrote for fun, actually. It wasn't for a specific project. It was just kind of, I wanted to try out some different ideas with drums and guitars and try and make interesting sounds and try something new. So this this one was just just kind of an experiment mm. and to see to see how different things might come together. Well, let's listen to a little bit of this. So the next one is called Blue Addiction, and this is a piece that I co-composed with Mark Leggett. And we and this was another one that we were actually similar approach to Shame, where we just were trying out some different things. And so Mark is a fantastic guitar player and always has really great ideas. So he definitely brought a lot to this piece. Is there a story behind that title, Blue Addiction? I don't know. We we felt like it kind of sounded like a junky soundscape. <laughs> I, I, the reason I'm asking this is I was just rewatching the last episode of Breaking Bad. And so yeah. Just, did this? Were you inspired by that TV show? <laughs> I, I did love that TV show. I did, and it definitely takes you to some dark places for Ooh. sure. So yeah, this one uh, <laughs> this one sounds very it's very dark and not not a world you really want to be in. <laughs> Um, but we just, I had a lot of fun writing it. And so the blue addiction came from, uh, yeah, the basically drugs. <laughs> <laughs>
Now, Crystal, I understand that you studied film and music at Montana State University. Can you share with us what attracted you to their film and music program? Sure. So I grew up in Wyoming, and so there was an appeal of it being relatively close. Um, I knew that I wanted to study music and that I was very interested in music for film, but did, I wasn't... Did, I'm so sorry. Did you, did you play the, an instrument? Did you learn an instrument? I did. So I played, uh, I played piano from, you know, I started in piano lessons in first grade and then, uh, joined the band in fifth grade with a flute. <laughs> and then it just kept building, you know, in seventh grade, I started, I added electric bass and joined the jazz band. And then I played in the handbell choir at my church. And I just played, I loved music and wanted to be involved in, in it every way that I possibly could. So I would write, I loved film scores. I, my favorite thing to do would be to go to the music store and find, you know, instead of going to see, you know, the latest movie release or something, I would go and see what the latest film score release was (laughs) and try and find the piano reduction for it and go home and play it, you know, over and over again. Oh, sure. And so I knew I wanted to be involved in music for film and television in some way, but I wasn't quite sure what that meant or what, you know, I didn't even really know what my options were. So I had looked at various different schools and what appealed to me about Montana State was that I could study music and film. And I just really wanted to keep my options open and I felt like it would be a place that would allow me to study in the way that I wanted to. Now, just to be specific, just to, oh, just to, yeah. clar- just to clarify, this wasn't a film music course. You were studying two different disciplines, film as a discipline and then music as a discipline, but not a combined that, discipline. Is that correct? That, that's correct. So I was double majoring. So oh, I was okay. in the film department and in the music department. So I was very busy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. So you, was, you were making your own movies, too. I was. I was. So I... Um, graduated from the film department, made my own senior film, and um, went through all that process, which was great because working now in the industry, I feel like I have such a better understanding of what everybody else is going through as far as what what their disciplines mean and what their challenges are and um, you know, and just and a, a good understanding of how it all comes together and how all these parts, there are so many parts involved and how they're just all so integral into the final project. Now, this is going to sound very naive, but I had always thought that f- film composers went to film composing schools, you know, schools that specialized in teaching music to be written for movie or, or TV. I, for, I, for some reason, I never thought of the option of studying both film as a major, double majoring in music. I think that's absolutely brilliant. Would you recommend that course of study for other composers that are looking to break into the film and TV industry? I would absolutely recommend it. It's definitely a different approach. I know that a lot of the people that I have met out here that have gone to other music schools and studied composition and specifically film music composition more extensively, um, that you definitely get a very different education that way. Um, and so I think they both have, they both are extremely valid and both very helpful. I think it depends on your personality and, you know, what, what you're looking for. I was looking for something a little more open. And I think the film scoring programs, at least in my perception, seem very, very focused. And that's mm. the only thing you do. Interesting. And so it sounds like you really had a creative itch you needed to have scratched to be able to not be limited just in the music, but also to understand that other medium just as well as your music. I did. And, you know, I was just I was so interested in the overall, you know, I was obviously most interested in the music, but I just really was fascinated by this whole idea of creating films and television projects and how that comes together and who are all these people and what do they do? And, um, and just, it's such a, it's interesting because as a musician and and composer specifically, I find you spend a lot of time on your own. And so it's, it was interesting to see 
the hugely collaborative aspects of the industry as well. Mm, mm. Thank you so much for sharing that insight. It's, it's just really a wonderful way to approach it. Now, I wanted to jump to talking a little bit about Legativity Music. You just mm-hmm. mentioned your work with Mark Leggett, uh, who he actually owns this company. And he I does. think you started working there in 2008. And I understand that this is a full-service music production company that provides thousands of music tracks that can be licensed for use in projects. And some of their clients have included Fox TV, PBS, the History Channel, NBC, among others. I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about how you got that job and what it was that you did there. Sure. It it was a very roundabout way that I got the job, <laughs> uh, as I find most jobs are. They're never, there's never a direct path. Welcome to the 21st century. <laughs> exactly. So when I had first moved out to Los Angeles, I was... I began as an intern at a music clearance company called The Music Bridge and ended up being hired on as an employee there and worked there for about a year, which was great education into the business aspects of the industry because that was something that I just wasn't very familiar with. And so getting a big understanding of what what a synchronization license is and what what does it mean to be a publisher and you know who what are the various copyrights involved in music and who's responsible for what and so that was a great place to start and through that company um, I met various people and started to pursue music editing and so music editing is um, can can be different depending on the composer and the project you're working on. But essentially, you're there supporting the composer. And so you're involved in the project from start to finish. So when a a new project comes in, you'll be there with the composer and the director at the spotting session, taking notes. Um, Now, just to explain, the spotting session is where you see a rough draft of the film or TV and you listen to a rough draft of the music, is that right? Or are you just right. listening to the music, the film itself, watching the so film itself? It de- you'll listen to whatever they've been working with. So if they've put in temp music, you'll listen to that. If they don't have music, you know, you don't put anything in. But you'll sit down with the director and a lot of times the editor as well and go through and you pick the spots where you want to put music. Ah, I see. So you say and you pick the, you find, okay, I want it to come in you know, at this specific place, but it needs to be out by this point. Mm. So you end up, after the spotting session, you end up with an idea, not only of what kind of music the director's looking for, but you're also finding out how much music you're going to need to compose for this project. Yeah. Because you'll have, you have these notes, and so you will be able to tell, you know, an, a, a minute count of, okay, well, we're looking at 30 minutes of music or we're looking at 60 minutes of music. And what does that mean for our schedule? What does that mean for our budget? All that oh, kind of wow. Thing. Wow. You're really breaking it down to the business nitty gritty. Uh, and it's not just this, just this random aesthetic thing, but you actually have to calculate minute by minute how much work is getting done and the timing and everything. Wow. It does. Well, because, you know, and so that's a lot of the music editor will end up kind of keeping track of that, those nitty gritty Ah, aspects. The the idea is to then for, you know, for myself as a music editor, I'll keep track of all that. So it allows the composer to remain in a very creative space. So you're not there just with a razor blade cutting a couple measures here or there or telling him to rewrite. You're not interfering in the creative process that way. You're just keeping track of the, the timing logistics, as it were. The, right, the the logistics of everything, and then once as as you're progressing through the film, then you do start doing that cutting because they'll ah, make changes to the film. I see. And so then you and the composer will look and go, okay, did how how did the changes affect it? Is it something that we can edit, or is it something that needs to be completely rewritten? Ah. So if it's something that just needs to be tweaked a little bit, you know, they move something around or it changed slightly, then. The music editor can come in there, whereas if you know they completely change the scene, it'll probably need to be rewritten. But 
So we were talking about your work with this music clearance company, yes, really right. fascinating. And then there's, I know there's a roundabout end to the story that leaves you at Legativity Music. Right. <laughs> Sorry, I, can actually, I can actually get there. I got it off. No, that's okay. It's, it's, it was great. I love this tangent because it really gave us a glimpse into the inner workings of what it's like to be in the film, TV, music industry, just the, the day-to-day tasks. This is really interesting. So help us understand how you ended up at Legativity Music in 2008. Okay, so I had been interviewing at another company um, trying to get work as a music editor. And so I did encounter a little bit of um, a few barriers along the way. There is a music edit, there's a union that music editors are a part of, and I was not in the union. So that was a bit of a setback for a few things. You know, I would get people interested, say, you know, we would love to work with you go get in the union and then come back to us. But the problem about getting in the union is that you have to work. <laughs> so oh, like, no. One of these classic catch 22s. So you got to join classic. the union, but you can't join the union because you can't, but you can't work because you're not. So how do you work around that? That sounds so silly. It's, it's very strange. And so what, what <laughs> ended up, so what happens is that you you do find the this work that is non union work under the table work. Oh my it's god! So <laughs> it's like you, and then you are able to uh, accumulate a, a certain amount of hours and productions under your belt, and then you'll have people that can basically vouch for you I and see. say yes, they have done their work as a music editor. Let them in. So. This company that I, I had interviewed with them a couple different times, and ultimately it didn't work out. But the woman that owns the company had she had called me one day, and I was I had been doing a bunch of kind of odd jobs. The the interesting thing about going to film school as well was that I ended up with a lot of production jobs, mm. just kind of on the side. So I would work on. Um, you know, as a coordinator for a documentary or I'd work as a production assistant for a reality TV show for a day or something, you know, it was just kind of a, a very odd selection of jobs that I held at one point. But so she, the woman at the music editing company called me and said, you know, that they had a composer that they worked with that was looking for help. And so, and she wanted to know if I was available, which yes, I was. And so she put me in touch with Mark Leggett and, um, yeah, and he basically hired me on the spot, and off we went. And that was about eight, nine years ago now. So Fantastic. And so you work primarily as a music editor with Mark? I do. I work as I a music see. editor, and then I also work uh, in his studio as a general assistant as far as um, engineering recording sessions or hiring musicians or um, just kind of general studio management as well. That's interesting. Now, Mark Leggett, as we mentioned, he's the Emmy-nominated composer and owner of Legativity Music. Now, you mentioned in your bio that he was very influential to you, not only as an employer, but also as a mentor. And he helped you to break into the television and film composing world. Can you share with us, what are some of the most important things that Mark taught you? Well, you know, it's, I think there's a lot of, I guess, important but not exciting things. <laughs> well, you know, sometimes it's the sundry things that, that lay a critical foundation for being employable. It is. You know, there was just, there was a lot of the technological aspects of the industry that I was not very well versed in. Such when as? I, so when I started working for him, I knew how to use Pro Tools. And, and Pro Tools is a software for editing music and re- recording and editing Recorded music, basically. Correct. So mm-hmm. Pro Tools is the software that I primarily use as a music editor. So I was okay going in there, but as a composer, he really showed me there's a program called Logic. that um, And various various composers use different programs. There, um, there are a couple of them out there, and it's just kind of a preference thing. So, But Mark uses Logic. So I learned from him how to use Logic to compose. Uh-huh. And... You know, there was for it was always difficult for me. It's difficult when you have a a limited knowledge of a program because then I feel like it takes you, it's more frustrating than it is helpful. You spend so much time trying to learn how to do what you want to do, and you go, ah, if I could just, I could just sit down at the piano and do this, and it would be done, you know? Yeah. And so, but 
he really showed me a lot about that. He showed me a lot about recording techniques. He showed me, you know, and actually one thing that's been really fascinating for me is we come, Mark and I come from very different musical backgrounds. So my background is more of a classical training mm -hmm. and his is definitely, he plays by ear very well and he grew up playing in bands and he, you know, he'll, he can pick up the guitar and play you any style of music that you wow. want. And, and just our different approaches to music have been really interesting to me just to see how he, you know, how he starts his creative process. And, um, and I think both of us together then create something kind of in the middle <laughs> that, that tends to work, I think. I'm wondering also, b prior to working with Logic, did you do composing by hand, on you know, pencil and paper on staff, on manuscript paper, or did you use a different program, a combination? Prior to using Logic, what, how did you put your music down? I did, prior to using Logic, I used paper and pencil. I did, um, while I was a, in Mo at Montana State, the very first film that I scored there, I literally had a, a pad of manuscript paper and I sat down with a metronome and the movie <laughs> and I barred it out and put in check marks where different things need to happen. And it was probably the most basic way you could approach scoring. <laughs> and, but that, that was how I did it. And so what was fantastic about Montana state was that the other musicians in the music program were just so great to work with. And so I had a, a wonderful opportunity in that everything I wrote up until then was all recorded live. Mm. And so I was able to use the recital hall to record anything that I needed. And um, so that was, that was great. So, but then logic became extremely helpful, you know, once moving to Los Angeles is I, you know, I'm, I'm not part of a, a university now where I have you know, musician friends around every corner in a recital <laughs> hall down the street. You know, <laughs> so I've got to find other ways to make it happen. So that for me right now, that's the only way I can do it. That's fascinating. So what are some of the, your next projects that you're most excited about? I have, there's another documentary that I'm getting ready to start that I'm very excited about the music for that because I think it'll be completely different than anything I've written before, which always excites me. It's a little nervous, you know, it makes me a little nervous, but, uh, but I'm mostly excited. It's about, uh, consciousness and kind of what, what makes people alive and interact and, and how are humans different than other animals as far as how we interact and things like this. So it's still very early in the process, so I haven't actually started yet, but I've been in discussions with the director. So I'm very excited about that. And then I do have um, just some personal projects. There's a, there's a short film that I've been working on that is directed by my husband. Oh, and cool. He, that has been a, a very interesting process. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I hope you work well together. <laughs> we, you know, I, we, we do okay. We don't do great, <laughs> I will say. So it's been a little bit of a challenge, but... In working on this, I've actually, there are a bunch of pieces that have not been right for the film, but that I really liked. And so that's one thing that I think is great about composing for these projects is, you know, even if the director or somebody, you know, if the piece of music gets thrown out, like it, it's not actually thrown out, it's thrown out of the project, but you still have it. Ah. And so there's this series of um, piano works that I would like to continue to to polish up and finish and, and get those out there. One of the most difficult aspects of being a composer for a collaborative project like this must be when somebody tells you, oh, no, cut this out. And you've probably spent, you know, a ton of time putting that idea together. And they say, nope, don't like it, cut it out. I mean, does that affect you personally? And I, I guess I'm thinking of this in reference to working with your husband. Are you able to detach yourself professionally to say, you know, okay, he doesn't want these five minutes here. And instead of saying, oh, you don't like what I created? Right. <sighs> I'm not cooking dinner for you tonight. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, fine. Never working with you again. There you go. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> no, it's definitely, I mean, it's a challenge and it's something that I'm very aware of because, you know, you have to keep in mind that it is a collaborative process. And yeah. so, you know, if I'm sitting down to write something that's personal for me, I'm in complete control. If I like it, I like it. If I don't, I don't. Mm. And, but so it's, you know, you have to be okay with, having someone say they don't like it and realizing it doesn't mean they don't like you and it doesn't mean they don't think you're talented. It just means that that's not right for the project. And so it's, it's definitely a kind of a personal challenge because it is, you know, music is a very personal thing. Yeah. And I think, you know, you're working on something and you put so much of yourself into your work. Yeah. And so it can be difficult to keep that separation. It's a whole nother skill, isn't it? Learning to get that extra layer of skin where you understand the difference between pouring your heart into something and yet letting it go if it doesn't work. Exactly. It's, you know, and I think it's just one of those things that's going to be that, you know, for everyone is is an ongoing challenge because you know, like like you were saying, like you do, you pour yourself into this and you, you know, you play it for someone and you you're excited about it and you think that it's great because why else would you play it for them unless you <laughs> thought it was great. And and that it is just, you know, to be able to not get so jaded that you don't put yourself into your work, mm. but to be able to realize, you know. And so one one thing that I do to help with that is, as I was saying before, is that, you know, if they don't like it, that doesn't mean that you can't still continue that piece on your own. That's a great approach. And yeah. to just, you know you can keep that for yourself. And who knows, maybe not, Maybe you never share it with anybody, maybe it never goes anywhere, but it's still something that has value to you and mm. it can stay that way. Now, if money were no object and you could pick up the phone and call anybody and have them at your beck and call, what would your dream project be to provide the music for? My, you know, my dream project is one day I, I would just so love to write a symphony and have it performed mm -hmm. live. That's, that's the dream for me okay. is to be able to, um, you know, if, you know, if I could go to something that the, the LA Philharmonic plays out here and that would just, I mean, that would be top of, <laughs> right. that would just be fantastic. Well, Crystal, you have to promise me that when you, when your symphony gets performed by the LA Philharmonic, you'll let me know. We'll have you back have you back on the show to help promote it. Okay, is that a Thank promise? You. I I will promise. There you go. <laughs> we'll have you back, <laughs> Crystal. What a delight to spend time with you. Thank you so much for sharing these wonderful glimpses into your life and music. Thank you so much for having me. This has been great. Okay. For links to Crystal's music and a great picture of her with some of the members of Asperger's Are Us at the South by Southwest Festival, visit the show notes at amusicallife.com. While you're there, be sure to sign up for our weekly newsletter to get the latest updates on show guests and special events. And if you enjoy this show, I hope you'll take a moment to post a quick review on iTunes by going to amusicallife.com forward slash review. And don't forget, you can also send me your feedback or your own musical stories by voicemail by going to amusicallife.com and looking for the send voicemail tab along the right side of the screen with your smartphone or computer. I'd love to hear from you. And if you're a musician or band, I'd love to help promote your music. Until next time, I'm Hugh Sung, and I wish you a musical life.